It's Tuesday, July 9th. I'm Trayvell Anderson. And I'm Priyanka Arabindi, and this is What A Day, the podcast that's always six degrees from fame and fortune. Kevin Bacon recently told Vanity Fair that he went in public disguised as a normie. He said he hated not being treated special and sane. The part I don't understand is our six degrees here. Are you saying that we're connected because we're normies? Because honestly, (laughs) I find that offensive. On today's show, Republicans introduced their party platform and they say they're going to be less terrible on abortion, but we really know they'll still be terrible. Plus, with the Olympics just a few weeks away, we hear from an athlete fighting for greater trans inclusion in sports. But first, President Biden continues to aggressively push back on the idea that he would step aside from this presidential race. He started Monday morning by sending a letter to all of the congressional Democrats saying that despite the speculation, he is, quote, firmly committed to staying in this race and beating Donald Trump. To that end, he once again asserted that he believes he's the best person to beat Trump. He also called into MSNBC's Morning Joe, striking a defiant and decidedly populist tone. Take a listen to this clip. I'm getting so frustrated by by the elites. Now, I'm not talking about you guys, but about the elites in the party who they know so much more. But any of these guys don't think I should run against me. Go ahead. Announce announce the president. Challenge me in the convention. Mm. I do think the Morning Joe hosts count as elites personally, but (laughs) maybe that is just me. And later in a call with hundreds of top Democratic donors and bundlers, Biden said that he is done talking about the debate and he implored Democrats to move forward, ignore the distractions and turn the focus back to Donald Trump. Listen, Biden said he's not going anywhere. You heard what he said, Priyanka. (laughs) Yes, he very much does not want to go anywhere. That is very, very clear. And this is just the start of a very busy week for Biden. Starting today, he is hosting the 75th NATO summit in Washington, D.C., which we'll talk a little bit more about in headlines. And he is now scheduled to have a solo news conference on Thursday at the end of that summit. That's something that has been typical in the past for past presidents, but not for Biden. It will certainly be very closely watched. And another thing that was closely watched yesterday, it was reported that a neurologist who specializes in Parkinson's disease visited the White House eight times between last summer and this spring. Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre originally refused to offer any detail about the visits, including who that doctor was seeing and why. But late yesterday, the president's physician, Dr. Kevin O'Connor, said in a memo that the neurologist was part of the team that examined the president during his annual physical. Dr. O'Connor reaffirmed that, according to that last physical, the president is doing fine. And he added that Biden has not seen a neurologist outside of that time. He didn't specifically address why that doctor was there several more times in recent months, though he did say that that doctor regularly held clinics there in the past. Obviously, a lot going on with all of this. To dig into all of it, I spoke earlier with Tara Palmieri. She is a senior political correspondent for Puck News and the host of the election podcast, Somebody's Gotta Win. I started by asking her how lawmakers felt about Biden's letter. Well, publicly, there are only a handful of lawmakers that have come out and said that he should not be at the top of the ticket. He should not run for re-election. And that's really not enough to make any sort of movement, right? Right now, it would be leadership in the party that could activate any sort of pressure on Joe Biden, even though, and I'm talking about Chuck Schumer, Hakeem Jeffries, um, Nancy Pelosi, who's sort of like honorary leader. And... They're not doing anything. They're saying publicly that they're behind Biden. And I know from my sources that privately they're not applying pressure to him either. And I've just heard a a lot of resignation uh, that this is just the way it is. We can't get him to step down. He's got to make the decision himself. But I I have to think that if there was a large number, like 100 or so members of Congress, not just 10 or so speaking out, it would be a totally different story. But right now you've got, you know, leadership in the Congressional Black Caucus saying we're standing behind him. You've got John Fetterman, a senator from Pennsylvania, a huge state. I mean, if you win Pennsylvania, it means you're probably going to win Michigan and means you're probably going to win the election. That's the blue wall. And he's saying, let's stick with Joe Biden. So you've got some really powerful forces and some loud voices on the Hill saying we got to stand by our man. But I've got to tell you, my phone has been blowing up since that debate from Senior Democrats, nervous. You're hinting at this, but what's the mood in general been like, especially since 
Congress returned yesterday among not only leadership, but just rank and file Democrats as well. They feel like they're on the Titanic, some of them. Like, they just feel like they're going to go down. Some of them won't stay in office because he's at the top of the ticket, right? Others are in safer districts and they'll hang on and they'll be in the minority. And it's not fun to be in the minority, especially if you've got Donald Trump in the president, you know, with the House and Senate, he's got full control. It's just not fun for them. And and Democrats have already been in the minority for the past two years in the House with a very slim majority in the Senate. So there's just a feeling that their leader is not in a strong position. They see the polls. They don't think that he can win. And Are they uh, treating it like a foregone conclusion at this point? In a lot of ways, yes, because they don't think that there's any way to apply pressure to Joe Biden, that it's just, he just keeps withstanding it. Now, he has a very big week ahead of him. He has that NATO conference in Washington, D.C., He's going to have a big press conference during that event, and he's going to have to take questions from the press. And if he's able to present a stronger performance to the American people, maybe it will quiet things down for a while. But if he messes up names of world leaders, it could just reignite the fire again. Biden also called into MSNBC's Morning Joe on Monday. He struck a really populist tone. He claimed that it's the elites and the media who are trying to push him to get out of this race and that the average voter is still behind him. But does polling actually back that up at this point? No, that's the thing. The polling does not back that up. And I've been saying this for a long time, but Biden and Trump have been neck and neck this whole time, right, for almost a year or more. And Biden was always ahead of Trump in 2020 by a sizable amount. Four points was maybe his lowest in some polls, but he was always ahead. He's been behind Trump in national polls. Trump is historically underpolled, so Trump could be doing even better than what the polls are showing. And in the end, in 2020, even though it showed that Biden would beat Trump by four to five to 10 points, it was a much closer race than anyone expected. Biden obviously wants to put this debate about him staying in the race to bed. It's clearly not over, though. What are you watching for that could shift how either Biden or other lawmakers act here, in addition to, you know, how he performs in unscripted events? We're going to be looking for leaks that come out of the White House that tell us more about the president, his health, his day-to-day life. Then again, next week is the Republican National Convention. All eyes will be on Donald Trump. He has been out of the spotlight for the past 10 days. It's revolutionary, frankly, but he's obviously realized that making this a referendum on Biden is a better position for him than making it a referendum on himself. But next week will be all about him. He'll be choosing his vice president. We'll see how that goes over. We'll see how the RNC flows. He has his own abilities to self-sabotage as well. He's only a few years behind Biden. Let's not forget that. That was my conversation with Tara Palmieri. She is a senior political correspondent for Puck News and the host of the election podcast, Somebody's Gotta Win. Thanks for that, Priyanka. In other news, the Paris Olympics are just a couple of weeks away. Many of us have been watching the trials and celebrating all those who will get a chance to compete on Team USA. One of the folks who will be there after qualifying last week is runner Nikki Hiltz, who is trans and non-binary. Their participation is particularly of note because they will be one of few openly trans people at the games. And during a sociopolitical moment where trans people, trans women especially, are being banned from sports team participation that aligns with their identities. Yes, what an interesting moment to be a trans athlete on this Olympic stage. Also, I keep forgetting just in the midst of everything going on, the Olympics are really so soon. They're really right around the corner. Mm Mm-hmm. As we've covered on this show, in the U.S., Republicans especially are pushing anti-trans policies in state legislatures that include sports bans that specifically target trans girls and women. We've also talked about the conservative-backed lawsuit against the NCAA and its policy that allowed trans swimmer Leah Thomas to compete for and win a women's championship title in 2022. There is a long recent history of this. 
Yeah, and so it's a big deal that Nikki will be able to represent trans and non-binary communities in this way and on Team USA nonetheless. But I want to introduce y'all to another trans person who's been trying to get to the Olympics for a few years, but she's barred from doing so based on the inconsistent policies of track and field's governing body. Her name is Cece Telfer, and in 2019, she became the first openly transgender person to win an NCAA title while she was a student at New Hampshire's Franklin Pierce University. Her hurdling win set off a firestorm of transphobic attacks, an experience she details in her new book titled Make It Count, My Fight to Become the First Transgender Olympic Runner. I wanted to chat with Cece as an athlete navigating this moment, and I started by asking her about making history back in 2019. I mean, 2019 was definitely a breakthrough and a milestone for me, but it also was, it triggered this big conversation around women's sports and if transgender women belong in sports. I didn't realize that I was going to be the pioneer of that conversation and just me living authentically in my truth and in who I am was going to trigger all of this backlash and all of this war between women and society and even between women together you know what i mean mm -hmm. but in the moment i felt like god answered my prayers my whole life as a child i always saw myself as a woman and i always thought i was gonna be an olympian and 2019 was definitely like a validation of that and like you have what it takes to get to the olympics yeah, and we recently found out that this year in Paris, there will be a trans runner headed to the Olympics. Trans and non-binary runner Nikki Hiltz will travel to Paris to compete in women's track and field for Team USA. What was your reaction to hearing that news, especially as someone, you know, is, was an Olympic hopeful, but can't? I'm ecstatic for Nikki. I just saw the news good for them but at the end of the day i was barred from competing as a transgender woman nikki is a transgender non-binary individual so it just shows that the rules is not fair and equal i got barred for no reason i got barred for being who i am which just shows that it's not about the science and the facts of sports if it was about all women and all bodies then i would be competing in the olympic trials with a fair shot like everybody else and to that, I say good for Nikki for smashing it and taking it and taking it all the way to the top. I want to ask you about your book. It's titled Make It Count, My Fight to Become the First Transgender Olympic Runner. It's all about your experience, right, as a trans athlete. But it's also about your willingness, right, to keep going in the face of so much hatred and foolishness that you've had to deal with. And something that we often talk about in community, right, is how visibility is a paradox. I'm wondering... When you were in the process of writing this book, who were you writing it for? What did you want them to take away from it? When I was writing this book, I definitely had in mind the generation to come. Mm -hmm. I was definitely speaking to the little ones, the little trans kids. Also, I realized that I was talking and speaking to little Cece because she didn't see somebody like her on the athletic stage. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are Black women that dominate sports. Like, sports is for Black people, period. Mm -hmm. However, I feel as though that there was nobody that really, truly represented who I am to the fullest truth and authenticity. And I really believe that everyone deserves to see a physical manifestations of their dream in order to achieve them. So you were just speaking a little bit about little CC and what we know, right, is that like this debate over trans women in sports is also taking place in schools, right, with young people. Several states have passed laws banning trans girls in particular from playing team sports for fun. In an interview with the New York Times in 2021, you said that you began running track in elementary school in Jamaica where sports are not divided by gender, I kind of want to hear you talk a little bit about what you think about the young trans girls in particular, right, who are being forced to sit on the bench because of so many of these policies. I think it's outrageous that the people who benefit from the life-saving aspect that sports has to provide are the ones being barred from having access to it. Sports has saved my life so many times. And it's also helping transgender kids process and handle what they're going through at home. We know it's hard and it's not easy. 
sports is a good outlet to channel all of these things, right? All of what we're feeling, very normal human being emotions. And now that we can't have access to the basic right of practicing sports is outrageous. Like sports just gives us that belongingness that we're looking for. Because I know that for a fact, my book talks about it too. Like every single day I'm being bullied. When I'm an athlete, trust me, the bullyingness doesn't stop. However, when you're a good athlete, your teammates have to fight for you. They have to defend you because they want you to win. They want you to make the team look good. You are a representation of them. So if you're doing the team a favor of doing great and like killing it and getting the team points, they're going to defend you. You gain so much respect as being just an athlete. And I feel like everybody should have fair access to that. Absolutely. I wonder what advice do you have for school leaders, for coaches, specifically when it comes to supporting any trans youth that might be either in their school or on their sports teams? What would you tell those adults, right, about how to support those children? I would tell these adults if they don't know how to support trans and non-binary kids, the number one thing is to lead with love and understanding. When you lead with love and understanding, you are able to accommodate other people because you're able to listen to their needs and their wants. Another part that is missing is that these coaches, athletic directors, and people at high level of organization that are looking to have a more inclusive environment and space for transgender and non-binary people, especially transgender women, we have to have bodies on committees that are making decisions in our lives that look like us and that represent us. Also, when it comes to college and high schools and any sorts of educational campuses, I believe and I feel like it's very necessary and it's very important to implement sensitivity training right at the beginning. Like orientation, how we talk about everything else, what is allowed and what is not allowed on campus. Implementing that in orientation will nip it right in the bud. Discrimination, not allowed. Trans people exist. Non-binary people exist. Implementing protocols. Coaches and athletic directors can implement protocols that help students and athletes like us. And these are the tools and steps that we can take in order to have a more inclusive environment and in order to embrace all these different bodies and different kids and people. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. Now, one of, if not the most common arguments against allowing trans women in particular to compete in sports is that trans women have some sort of unfair advantage against cis women. But there's not a lot of science, right, to back up that claim. Mm -hmm. But really, I want to hear you talk to those people who say that athletes like yourself have it easy. What do you say in response to those people? People who think that we have an advantage or we have it easy is completely phallus and folly, and it's not true. We are immediately faced with threats. We have to worry about going to competitions and the fact that we might not leave that competition alive today. We might not cross that finish line alive. I don't know if any other athletes have these things in the back of their heads when they're training, when they're competing, but this is the first thing at the forefront of my brain everywhere I go because it's very real. It's very real that a parent can snap and take my life because they feel as though that I'm taking something away from their child. And people are saying that I have an advantage. I can't wake up as a transgender woman and say, I'm going to play sports. I'm going to play elite sports. No, I have to wait a whole year of going under a certain protocol and expectations and rules. My organization does not give a fuck about me. They only care about the results that I have to produce that follows the guidelines. And even if I am following the guidelines, they still have the ability to tell me no. Mm. The science and facts shows that transgender women have no advantages and we do not have it easy. If anything, we have it hard because the medications and rules that we have to follow is making our bones more brittle and more prone to osteoporosis where at risk for medical implications every single day. Blood clots, heart attack can happen at any time. These are the things that we sign over. We can't get better. We can't get faster. We don't even have coaches, facilities, or organization that support us. So how is that an advantage if we're struggling constantly? We don't have money or resources or tools to do what we love, and we're still posing a threat? The only people that have advantages right now are the people who are allowed to compete and play without any medical implications of their body. They don't have to worry about showing up and not leaving that track alive. Mm -hmm. All they have to Mm -hmm. worry about is executing. Yeah, it's a mess. 
We started this conversation talking about your goal to get to the Olympics. So I want to end our conversation there. Absolutely. What is next for your journey in getting to the Olympic stage? My goal next in getting to the Olympic stage 2028 Los Angeles is honestly just trying to stay safe, sane, healthy, and rise to the occasion in a healthy and positive way and look forward to the indoor season next year because nobody's going to ever stop me from competing but myself. I'm always going to show up. I'm always going to compete. You're not going to stop me from running. I'm going to look forward to 2028 because I am capable and I'm worthy and I'm going to compete next season. And, you know, just keep fighting the good fight and hoping that the next four years to come that this decision will somehow miraculously reverse with... Me just being present and people, other athletes showing up for me, showing up for women. I'm excited for what my book brings to the table. I'm excited for other athletes to read my book. I'm excited for people to see that, like, not all trans people are the same and they're, the stories are different. And see what we really go through, unfiltered, raw, and very necessary. I'm just excited to live. And I'm excited to be happy because nobody is going to break my soul and you can't take my happiness. I'm excited for all of that. That was my conversation with Cece Telfer, author of Make It Count, My Fight to Become the First Transgender Olympic Runner. And you can catch the Olympics July 26th through August 11th on NBC. That is the latest for now. We'll get to some headlines in just a moment. But if you like our show, make sure to subscribe, share it with your friends. We'll be right back after some ads. As a chef and a restaurant owner, I'm as meticulous about my cookware as I am about my ingredients. That's why I love Made In Cookware. Each pan they make isn't just designed to perform, it's crafted to last. As a mom, I love that I can trust Made In. It's made from the world's finest materials, so I can feel good about what I'm feeding my family. I'm Chef Brooke Williamson, and I use Made In Cookware. You're a pro. You can make a five-ton HVAC condenser purr like a sleeping kitten. Weeds cower at your mere presence. The only thing cleaner than your clients' homes is your reputation. So why is a pro like you still stuck in the endless cycle of paperwork, scheduling, spreadsheets, and chasing invoices? Automate your office and get back to what you love with Jobber, the all-in-one tool that fits your entire office in your back pocket. Start your free trial today at Jobber.com. <laughs> Okay, it's true. You might have a group chat to dissect your latest lapse in judgment with your girls. But when it comes to the Supreme Court ruling on women's organs and ignoring oath-bringing insurrectionists, it's going to take more than an emoji reaction to figure out what it all means and how it affects you. That's where strict scrutiny comes in. Think of us as your personal group chat for all things SCOTUS-related. If everyone in your group chat had constitutional law degrees or was constitutional law curious. We are breaking down every case, scrutinizing every bad decision, and giving you so much inside scoop on court culture, Andy Cohen is shaking in his boots. Wait, who is that again? Find new episodes of Strict Scrutiny every Monday wherever you get your podcasts and now on YouTube. And with the track record of the current court, there will be a lot to discuss. Now let's wrap up with some headlines. Headlines. The Republican National Committee released its 2024 policy platform on Monday dedicated to the, quote, forgotten men and women of America. Wonder what in the world they could possibly mean by that. The committee has leaned heavily into Trump's America First agenda, and the text of the 16-page document reads like a truth social post, random capitalizations, and all. The platform listed 20 promises that Republicans said that they'll stand by, including stop the migrant invasion and keep men out of women's sports. Okay, they're playing the hits here. Mm -hmm. But abortion, notably, is not a huge talking point in this doc. It is buried back on page 15. It states that Republicans, quote, will oppose late term abortion while supporting mothers and policies that advance prenatal care, access to birth control and IVF. I'll believe it when I see it, but I don't want to see it. I don't want to live to see this. Please, right. no. <laughs> this is a notable shift from the GOP's earlier stances that they would back a 20-week federal abortion ban. RNC members will vote on whether to confirm the platform at next week's Republican National Convention in Milwaukee. Also supposedly 
Amber Rose will be there. Mm, Amber mm, Rose, Kanye mm, West's mm, ex. Mm, random, mm. random, random. But if that is the type of talent that the RNC is pulling in, the good people of Milwaukee, you did nothing to deserve this. They got to get them black votes however they can yet, okay? Amber Rose. <laughs> The first major Atlantic storm of the season, Barrow, made landfall in Texas on Monday as a Category 1 hurricane. It killed at least three people in the Houston area and left nearly two million customers without power statewide. The National Hurricane Center said winds reached up to 80 miles per hour. According to state officials, several transmission lines were knocked out during the storm, and it could take days for electrical workers to restore power. Barrel started as a Category 5 hurricane in the Caribbean last week. Forecasters said that Barrel will likely be downgraded to a post-tropical cyclone today. As we mentioned earlier, world leaders gather in D.C. this week for the NATO summit and a celebration of the alliance's 75th anniversary. President Biden welcomes leaders to the three-day meeting later today, all while he faces rising scrutiny here at home over his ability to lead. The U.S. is NATO's most powerful member, so there is an air of uncertainty since members are worried about another Trump presidency. That is because Trump has been very critical of NATO in recent years. It would be a disaster for that and for so many other reasons if he were to be elected. A big focus of this week's summit is obviously the war in Ukraine, which has strengthened the alliance in size and in unity. Leaders are planning to back a new proposal that helps get equipment and training to Ukrainian armed forces. Still, tensions are a bit high. Ukraine is not actually a member of NATO, something that the country's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, has pushed for as he fights Russia. Boeing agreed to plead guilty to conspiring to defraud the federal government on Sunday. This was over two fatal crashes involving its airplanes. A Boeing 737 MAX crashed in Indonesia in 2018, and another crashed in Ethiopia the following year. The disasters killed more than 340 people in total. Boeing promised the Justice Department in 2021 that it would improve the safety of its planes. In exchange, the DOJ never prosecuted the plane company. But the department went back on the deal after a cabin panel flew off a Boeing plane earlier this year on an Alaska Airlines flight. Boeing's new agreement with the DOJ requires the company to pay a fine of more than $487 million and invest at least $455 million more towards making its planes safer. The agreement also requires Boeing officials to meet with the families of the victims of both plane crashes personally. Wow. Okay. I'm not sure if that is typical of these types of agreements, but maybe it should be. Faced with the prospect of that, you think these companies might do a little better. I really can't think of anything worse than facing the families of the people that their negligence has affected. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be them in this situation at all. Absolutely not. For so many reasons. Yeah. Yeah. And those are the headlines. One more thing before we go. The team over at Pod Save the UK has been doing an incredible job covering the results of UK's snap election last week and what they mean for the country and beyond. On Friday, they released a special election episode with everything you need to know about the results and their repercussions for global democracy. Last week, they also officially launched their own YouTube channel where you can find all of their full episodes, clips, and exclusive YouTube content. I will be tuning in. If you want to tune in yourself, search for Pod Save the UK on YouTube and make sure to follow them so you do not miss a thing. That is all for today. If you like the show, make sure you subscribe, leave a review, show the normies some love, and tell your friends to listen. And if you are into reading and not just a horror novel disguised as a GOP platform like me, What a Day is also a nightly newsletter. Check it out and subscribe at crooked.com slash subscribe. I'm Priyanka Arabindi. I'm Trayvell Anderson. And, and we love, love to, to be, be treated, treated as, as famous, famous people. people. Yeah, please. We're like D-list, not even. I don't know. Is that, <laughs> are we rounding up? Yeah. I'd like to think of myself on the D-list. That feels like a good thing for me. You know what? Let's do it. Me, you, and Kathy Griffin. Exactly. That's who I think of every time. <laughs> <laughs> what a Day is a production of Crooked Media. It's recorded and mixed by Bill Lance. Our associate producers are Raven Yamamoto and Natalie Bettendorf. We had production help today from Michelle Alloy, Greg Walters, and Julia Clare. Our showrunner is Erica Morrison, and our executive producer is Adrian Hill. Our theme music is by Colin Gilliard and Kashaka. Hold up. 
As a chef and a restaurant owner, I'm as meticulous about my cookware as I am about my ingredients. That's why I love Made In Cookware. Each pan they make isn't just designed to perform, it's crafted to last. As a mom, I love that I can trust Made In. It's made from the world's finest materials, so I can feel good about what I'm feeding my family. I'm Chef Brooke Williamson, and I use Made In Cookware. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. I obviously love a little Instagram or TikTok break, but social media can have a really big impact on your mental health. It can have you envying people, make you sad, make you angry. And that is why I go to therapy. Therapy can help you focus on what you want instead of what others have. Yes, I used to use BetterHelp. It was a great opportunity to be able to start therapy before going to like, you know, an in-person therapist. And listen, it helped me out a whole lot during the pandemic. Listen, y'all know we all was losing our minds. Yeah, if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient and flexible. Yes, just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Stop comparing and start focusing with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash WAD. 